Hi, thanks for tuning into my talk today. So I'm going to be talking about uh, the beginning of my PhD research in George Lauder's lab at Harvard University. So our lab does a lot of work on studying fish kinematics, so looking at how fish swim. And one of the most common ways of doing this is by abstracting fish bodies just to midlines. And this allows for really easy comparisons between fishes of different sizes, of uh, uh, fishes of different species, and even allows for comparisons between fishes and robots as seen in this image here. However, there's a bunch of problems with using midlines. So one of the biggest ones is it really, to generate good midlines, you really need really very controlled settings. So animals need to be orthogonal to a camera to get good 2D midlines, and you need two orthogonal cameras uh, to get good 3D reconstructions. And because of this, uh, it really limits the temporal scope of the work. So <clears throat> and by limiting the temporal scope, you're actually really limiting the diversity of midlines you might see. Um, as well as it's really limiting in the size of animals because you're often trying to swim animals in these controlled um, flumes where you can get good orthogonal images. And as someone who primarily has previously worked on studying fish in the wild, fish and sharks in the wild, uh, I've really been, really been trying to figure out ways to bridge this gap. So let's just come back to this figure and let's just zoom in on just one of these midlines here to really think about what a midline is. So a midline uh, you kind of traditionally think of it as a line in space here, um, and your x-axis is position along the body, um, and your y-axis axis is some sort of lateral displacement along the body. And when you go to measure it, uh, you, take, you take a camera frame, and you really have a series of points, and each point has some sort of x and y um, position, and you just kind of draw lines between them to generate a midline. However, an alternative way of kind of thinking about this, instead of focusing on the points in X and Y space, is to actually focus on the lines. So you can kind of think of each line as being at some angle orientation uh, from the previous point on the body. And if you use a framework like this, all you really need to know are these orientations. And then you take the cumulative sum of the cosine and the cumulative sum of the sine of all those orientations, you're actually able to generate a complete midline shape. However, you need one other piece of information, which is you need to know where the head is, um, right? Some sort of X and Y position of the head, um, some sort of offset. So, what, <clears throat> so if you know these pieces of information, you can generate the full reconstructed midline of an animal. So when I say orientation, what exactly am I talking about? So you can think of orientation as being composed of three main angles. So you have pitch, uh, which is along the longitudinal axis of an animal. You have roll, which is around that axis. So like uh, rolling side to side. And finally, you have yaw, which is changes in heading of the object, so in the XY plane. And one of the most common ways of measuring pitch roll and yaw of objects is an inertial measurement unit, which actually almost everyone probably has in their pocket right now in their cell phone. But these are sensors that are composed of really three separate things. You have a magnetometer. So this is the sensor that measures the Earth's magnetic field strength primarily. And so this is information in the X and Y plane. And so it provides information on yaw or heading. Uh, you have an accelerometer, which measures acceleration. And in the context of orientation, we're really talking about acceleration due to gravity. So this is a vector that points straight down to the core of the Earth. And finally, and this provides information on pitch and roll of the object. And finally, you have a gyroscope, which actually doesn't provide any information itself of orientation, um, but it tells you really good changes in orientation of the object. So we can kind of look at how these different sensors might interpret these different motions. So uh, during pitching motion, the magnetometer and accelerometer are both detecting these changes. However, if we compare this to roll, you see an accelerometer is able to pick, detect changes in roll, but a magnetometer is not right, because your rolling is around um, the magnetic field, as well as yaw, of course, um, an accelerometer does not pick up, but a magnetometer does, right? So independently, no one sensor provides you a complete picture, but by fusing them all together, they provide you really good estimates of pitch, roll, and yaw. Um, and so I wanted to take these sensors, fuse them together, um, and have an estimate orientation along a body. So the way I did this was by taking four inertial measurement unit data loggers um, and had each of them record at 100 hertz. I then implanted each of these data loggers in this flexible silicon foil. 
uh, just to hold them relatively stationary. And then I then would flap this foil back and forth. Um, and by flapping it, you're really just kind of trying to simulate fish-like movement. And I would change the frequency, the yaw, and the sway of this. I can then take all the data, post-process it, and estimate orientation. However, to know how good of a job I was doing, I need to have true midlines. So while I was collecting all this data, I was simultaneously recording ventral, um, a ventral view midline kinematics using high-speed video. I would actually hand identify the leading and trailing edge of each tag um, in a subset of images. And then I trained a deep lab cut uh, neural network to automate this process and track each one throughout all my trials. So what does this data really look like? So I'm just gonna look at the very first tag in the series, this blue one here. And when it's not being flapped, just sitting there, each thing is reg registering some amount of error and some baseline value. As we flap it, you begin to very clearly see signals of oscillation in the magnetometer, accelerometer, and gyroscope data. We can compare the first, center, first sensor, the leading edge sensor, to the very last sensor, the dark red sensor here. And right off the bat, you'll see there's differences um, very clearly in the gyroscope data, but also in the magnetometer um, and accelerometer as well. And we can actually fuse all these data um, together to generate these estimates of pitch roll and yaw that are meaningful to us. So this is what the data in the first for the first tag looks like. You'll see it's yawing back and forth by about 10 degrees. We can compare this to the last tag, this dark red one, and you'll see it's yawing by about twice as much. It's yawing back and forth about 30 degrees. Um, but the pitch and roll data isn't necessarily that different between the two tags. Um, and so this is great, but let's just view on, let's simplify this to the 2D plane, right? Let's just look at just yaw information. And so if you plot each position of the body, um, their yaw, their heading information over time, uh, you can see that they each have their own distinctive amplitude as well as their own distinctive phase shift compared to each other, which looks uh, semi-realistic to me. Uh, we can then compare that to the true heading of each point of the body based from the camera as you'll see in the bottom. And right off the bat, you'll see that they generally seem to have large agreement um, where they have similar uh, phase shifts and amplitudes. We can actually do point-wise regression between all these points. Um, and in this trial, you'll see that uh, the last two positions in the body have uh, almost perfect congruence. However, we see there's some hysteresis plots going on uh, in the first two parts of the body, the blue ones. And I think this is actually due to some of the sensor fusion uh, some sensor fusion lag, but I'm still exactly working on what's causing that. However, we haven't generated midlines. All we know is that the orientations from the IMUs are the same as the camera. So we can actually just take a snapshot at one point right here, for instance, and let's try and generate the midline. So here's the same X and Y midline schematic I was showing you earlier, where each box represents a part of the body, and we know the orientations because of the IMUs at these four points. We can actually interpolate what the orientation is um, by using a spherical linear interpolation, a slurp it's called. Um, and you can, and that's given by these black arrows. And then you can stack all the arrows on top of each other, cumulatively sum them, correct? And you generate a midline like this. Um, and of course, we're recording all this data and generating mid, uh, estimates of orientation at 100 hertz. And so when you then animate this, it looks, it gives you an, a midline kinematic um, profile that looks like this, which seems to be quite realistic to what it should be. However, you'll notice that the leading edge of the tag here is fixed. I haven't actually added in that X and Y offset, but you can actually use the sensed lateral, the latent acceleration um, of the tag to estimate what those X, Y, Z, and Z offsets are. And when you add that in, you can compare the tag, for the midline kinematics from the tag data on the top to the midline kinematics based on the video data on the bottom. And you'll see that there's general congruence and they look uh, very similar to each other. We can compare them, of course, uh, by using some, these, some more traditional midline plots like this. So this is, was during a trial where the tag was swayed back and forth three centimeters. And you'll see that the head motion of the IMU here uh, looks similar to the, cam the head motion of the camera tag. However, it is slightly underrepresented. However, the tail of the IMU tag here is generally has larger lateral displacements than the camera tag. 
However, we can compare this to a experiment where the tag was not swayed, it was just yod. Um, and you can again see the head displacement is quite accurate. Um, and actually, and you, you again see a slight overestimation of tail lateralness. And in both of these trials, you see a compression in the lateral aspect around the three quarters part of the body. Um, and we're still trying to figure out exactly uh, what's driving that. However, these are just the, these are underrepresenting the usefulness of this INU data because these are really just 2D projections of 3D data. So you can actually plot what these midlines look like in 3D. And not just do you get the sag along the body in three dimensions, the X, Y, Z, you also get the rotation around them. So you can actually can understand how the tag is leaning um, and rolling as it's moved back and forth through space, which I think is pretty uh, exciting. However, we're, we're still working on actually putting this on an animal still. And that's what's driving us to um, MIMU multi-IMU 2.0. So instead of having multiple independent tags, we're having one central data logging um, center with a bunch of uh, arms uh, or a, a, bunch of a sensor network branching out across the body where you have just the IMUs that are placed around. Um, and this would limit the, si uh, limit the size of the tag and allows for temporal uh, data standardization, which is pretty important. But just to wrap it up, in conclusion, uh, we're able to actually generate pretty accurate and reasonable midline kinematics um, from just animal-borne sensors. And this will allow for continuous midline generation on the scale of hours to days and allow us to do it on animals in the wild that we're not visually seeing. And this method isn't limited just to fish. You could put these same uh, sensor networks on uh, dogs or horses and estimate running gait, um, which I think is, it would be a really neat thing to do. But we still have a ton of work to do. So we're doing MIMU 2.0 to work on clock drift and make the tag smaller. Um, and we still have a bunch of work to do with some sensor fusion optimization, as well as what's the optimal number and location of sensors to put on the animal. And with that, I would just like to say thank you for listening um, and I enjoy whatever other talks you're going to listen to today. Thanks.